how many of you today for the first time saw the entire chapter of bank audit yeah today but you've written an exam before that no not written okay so with then it's okay without writing after writing an exam if you've seen the chapter for the first time then that's something which is a very concerning matter but yeah yes if we have if we have spent like 3 hours in the class studying the chapter of bank audit even you at your end need to spend 3 hours again you know going through the chapter again and that's only half the battle won you know we have a full battle to win over there so i want you to do the writing practice i want you to write down the answers i want want you to write down the words which are there regarding the bank audit over there right all good for everyone so let's quickly do this mcq over there bharat bank a nationalized bank has branches all over india as and in the most popular public sector bank in india for the past few years the bank is governed by the banking regulation act and the central statutory auditors of the bank abc associates were appointed according to the provisions of the relevant enactments the engagement partner c commenced the audit with his team of seven members so that the audit is completed on time and all the documents are submitted before the due date the audit at all the branches also started simultaneously and abc and associates was in constant touch with all the branch auditors to ensure timely completion of the audit as per the audit strategy and plan caq along with ms r and mr p were assigned the audit of the advances of bharat bank advances constituted the largest items on the asset side of the balance sheet of the bank since audit of advances is one of the most important areas by auditors in a bank audit it was assigned to caq since he was aware that of the various functional areas of the bank branch it processes procedure systems and prevailing internal control with regard to advances so much story sometimes you feel like what is the question let me read the question only okay caq started with verifying whether the advances were classified as per rbi prudential norm there were five categories of advances that were available to caq for verification they were standard regular substandard doubtful loss and the special mention account an aging analysis was available for doubtful advances and special mention accounts which was examined in detail by ca Q. Ms. R, on being instructed by CAQ, verified the securities offered by the borrower for the bank finance. For a particular customer named Aqua Bra Aqua Brass Private Limited, the security was in the form of delivery of goods by Aqua Brass to Bharat Bank with the intention of creating a charge thereon as security for the advance. So, what is that? Arey, what you are telling? The security was in the form of delivery of goods. क्या बोलू असाइनमेंट फ्रॉम वेर यू गॉट असाइनमेंट इज वेर यू सेट ऑफ बुक डेट्स ना assignment is for book debts and when for that one so no question of assignment pledge what did I, hypothecation when what did i make you write can neither the possession nor the pos ownership is transferred here what do they say delivery of the goods so can it be hypothecation hypothecation what did we say neither the possession nor the ownership of the goods can be transferred so what is this pledge okay anyways in case of another customer named prism works there was a transfer of a life insurance policy in favor of the bank as a security so now book debts and life insurance policy that is assignment okay the bank had absolute right over the policy r examined all the relevant documents for the above two cases in detail excuse me There is some noise coming from that side. Can you just tell them to keep silent? From outside, you'll have to go and tell. Coming from out. Okay. Right. She continued with her examination of the other securities based on the sample selected by her. While checking the classification of NPA, Mr. P came across a customer named Trustworthy, whose term loan instalment was overdue for 90 years at the year end, but it was 100% secured against the office building. The same was classified as substandard asset. There was another customer named Super 40. So this customer was named Trustworthy, and another customer was named Super 40, who had a cash credit account and a term loan with the bank. Super 40 had been paying the installments on the term loan as well as the interest on the cash credit account regularly and there was no overdue amount Mr P while verifying verified the drawing power of Super 40 and found it is less than the sanction limit throughout the year so very good now it is not exceeded the sanction limit it is less than the sanction limit the outstanding balance of Super 40 during the whole year exceeded the drawing power was less than the sanction limit right both the advances of Super 40 were classified as standard assets since the recoveries were regular 
work and outstanding in cash credit was less than the sanction limit. On examination of large advances, CAQ noticed that customer named Stylish and Smart Limited had one funded loan, term loan, and one non-funded loan, that is the bank guarantee and sanction from the bank. CAQ checked in detail whether commission earned by the bank on the bank guarantee was provided for on the accrual basis. CAQ along with Ms. R and Mr. P verified the advances in detail and also recommended a few changes in the classification provisioning. What are the sub, now had I not read the question also I could have answered this one. What are the subcategories of the special mention account? A, B, C or D? Right? Yes, SMA account showing stress signal, stress signal, not due for payment, not due for payment, not there. So C and D out. Now what is it? A or B. In that 31 to 60, 61 to 90 or 0 to 45 and 46 to 90. It is A. Okay. Right. Creation of security of Aqua Brass Private and Prism Work was in the form of pledge and assignment right so even if you're sure that the second one was the lic policy that is assignment then first one you have to confident that only that one combination is available of pledge and assignment okay in the opinion is trustworthy a standard asset or a substandard asset what is trustworthy loan installment was overdue for 90 days at the year end but it was 100 percent secured against the office building Yes, though it is due for 90 days, it is 100% secured, so it is a standard asset. Since it is due for 90 days, it is substandard irrespective of the security. Yes, though it is, yes, though, what did we say? NP classification is based on the record of the recovery. Okay, right, since it is not due, it is standard, uh, not due for more than 90 days and not due. So it is not due, no, it is due for 90 days. Okay, right, then after that, C, uh, 2.4, is super 40 correctly classified as a standard asset? Right, since Super 40 correctly classified as a standard asset, what does it say? For Super 40, what do you say? Yes, since the recoveries of term loans and cash credit were regular, it was less than the sanction limit. No, since the outstanding balance exceeded the drawing power, so both the advances, that is the term loan and cash credit will be classified as NPA. No, since the outstanding exceeded the drawing power for more than 90 days, the cash credit will be classified as NPA. And yes, since the recoveries were regular, there is no relevance of sanctioned and drawing power. So there is no relevance, not right. Right, so that is not right. Right, so what do you say? Super 40, right? How is it to be classified? Super 40 over there, right? A, do you think, why did you read one particular sentence over there in the question? What was one particular sentence over there in the question? Right, what does it say? One particular sentence in the question over there. That it was classified as standard since the recoveries were regu regular and outstanding balance in the cash credit was less than the sanction limit. But what does it say? The outstanding during a whole year exceeded the drawing power, but it was less than the sanction limit. What sentence did we study? That an account has to be within both the sanction limit also and it has to be within the drawing power also. It has to be within the sanction limit also and it also has to be within the drawing power. So here it is though less than the sanction limit, but is it within the drawing power? No. So that is why because all of you were saying A, I thought why were you saying A over there, right? So what is the answer over there? Yes, cannot be. Now no, what reason do you give for no? Since the outstanding and the cash credit exceeded the drawing power, so both the advances that is the term loan and the cash credit will be classified as an NPA. And what does it say? Cash credit will be classified as NP and term loan as standard? No, because what do we say? Asset classification to be done borrower wise and not the facility wise, right? So B would be the correct option. And which among the following is a non-funded loan? Demand loan, bills purchase discounted, letter of credit or the participation on risk sharing basis? It is the letter of credit. Okay, right? So that's a quick discussion of the MCQ over there. Now coming to the huge chapter, again, one of the most dreaded chapter in the intermediate audit syllabus, which is regarding the audit of the items of the financial statement, right? A super huge chapter. You know, in Hindi, there is a song, you know, ke, uh, 
ki you know you don't know where it starts and where it ends so this chapter is something like that you don't know where it starts and where it goes on and on and where the chapter ends over there right so audit of the items of the financial statement okay but before i discuss with you these items of the financial statement i just quickly need to revise with you essay 500 ka one part over there right i'm not discussing entire 500 but one part of 500 which is regarding the assertions address through substantive procedures right the assertions address through substantive procedure what is assertion statements whatever the management is trying to say through the financial statement represent through the financial statement that is assertion and we have these assertions for the account balances we have these assertions for the classes of transaction and we have these assertions for the presentation and the disclosure right so for account balances that means balance sheet item classes of transaction means the profit and loss account item and presentation and disclosure means the notes okay so example of a balance sheet item are you all with me example of a balance sheet item say is building example of a profit and loss account item is say rent and notes item say disclosures is of the contingent liabilities just an example right so that means what whenever i check any balance sheet item example when i'm checking a building you are told ke go and check the buildings of infosys so now means ma'am exactly what do i check of that building of infosys or you are go go and check the debtors of infosys so exactly what do you need to check in the debtors of infosys what you need to check for is the ercv right for profit and loss account you need to check for the ocacc right and for notes presentation disclosure you need to check for both the orcvc right the orcvc what does it mean if i have to check the building i need to check the existence of the building then i need to check the rights and obligations related to that building i need to check the completeness of the building and i also need to check the valuation and the allocation right the valuation and the allocation now tell me how do i check the existence of the building example i say oh i want to check really do they have a building how do i check that yes i can inspect the physical verification report hai no management would have done the physical verification at reasonable interval i check the physical verification report then i want to check building to hai but is it in the name of the company how do i check that by checking the title deed whether it is in the name of the company then i want to check the completeness now how to check the completeness completeness always means all is nobody there you are actually there is lot of sound coming can somebody just tell outside can you just go and tell anybody it will come in the recording also actually the sound system Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So we have the completeness. Completeness means what? Whether all buildings of Infosys have been recorded. Now, how to check whether all have been recorded? I always need to check for the schedule. What is sh schedule? Opening balance, add less, and the closing. So, what were the opening balances of beginning at the at the beginning of the year? What were the buildings purchased during the year? Buildings which have been sold during the year and buildings at the end of the year, right? So, that's the completeness and valuation. Whether the buildings have been carried in the books at the appropriate carrying value. So, that means I need to check as per end AS sixteen or the AS ten and also allocation. What will be the allocation? Depreciation, repairs and maintenance, insurance. Whether it has been charged to the profit and loss account. so what i have to check of the building ercv how i check the ercv this is how i check the ercv are you understanding that 
How I check the, what I have to check of the building? ERCV. How I check the ERCV? These are the audit procedures which I perform for the same. Right, then whenever I have to check any profit and loss account item. Now see, balance sheet, building can exist, but can rent exist? Can a building of a company exist? Can a debtor exist? Yes, but can rent exist? No, rent transaction can occur. So there you have the occurrence. Right, there you have the occurrence. Then you need to check whether all rent expenditure has it been accounted for. Right, then you also need to check the amount, that is the accuracy. Balance will have a value, transaction will have an accuracy. Right, balance will have an amount. There's a lot of noise coming actually, Rail, from this side. Right, if you can just tell them. Okay, right, so accuracy. Right, balance, building has a value, but rent, does it have value? No, rent has an amount. Right, so you need to check for the accuracy and then no, outside. Okay, right, accuracy. And then whether the transaction has been recorded in the correct accounting period. And then you also need to check has it been recorded in the proper amount. Yeah, account, right? So what does it say for profit and loss account item? I need to check whether the transaction is pertaining to the entity. Should not happen that geo limited account, rio limited rent has been accounted for. So whether the transaction is pertaining to the entity, whether all the transactions have been accounted for, have they been recorded at the proper amount, have they been recorded in the proper period and have they been recorded in the correct account. Right, this when I check OCACC, that means I'm checking whether the transaction has been properly recorded. When would you say that a transaction is properly recorded? When it is related to the entity, all transactions have been accorded, have they have been recorded at the proper amount in the correct period and in the correct account. Should not happen that rent has been recorded in traveling. Right, so OCACC, that is Occurrence, Completeness, Accuracy, Cutoff and Classification. And Disclosure, Schedule 3 Disclosure, it could be of a balance sheet item or it could be of a notes item. So if it is a balance sheet item, then I, if, I, if it's a profit and loss account item, I check for the occurrence. And if it's a balance sheet item, I check for the existence. If it's a balance sheet item, I check for the rights and obligation. Completeness, I always need to check. If it is a balance sheet item, I check for the valuation. If it is a profit and loss account item, I check for the accuracy. And then after that, we have the classification and the understandability, right? The classification and the understandability. Right, so these are the assertions addressed through substantive procedures for balance sheet, PNL, and the notes. Whenever I check any balance sheet item, what I have to check of that balance sheet item? ERCV. Whenever I check any this profit and loss account item, I need to check the OCACC. And whenever I check any notes item, I want to check the ORCVC. Are you understanding that? Right, what do you mean by OCACC? Right, occurrence, completeness, accuracy, cutoff and classification. So like example, I'm checking rent expense. What I should check, whether the rent expenditure is of GEO and not of RIO. Whether all rent expenditure, if they've taken 20 properties on rent, all 20 property rent expenditure has been recorded. Has it been recorded at the proper amount? Has it been recorded in the correct accounting period? Should not happen that 27 rent recorded in 26 or 25 rent recorded in 26. It should be recorded in the correct accounting period and also it should be recorded in the correct account. Are you understanding that? Okay, right. So now, yes, you cannot forget. Like, you know, you cannot not forget 143.1. You know 143.1? Du you already forgotten. Duty as to inquiry, six points of inquiry. 143.3, 10 points of reporting. Now what I discussed with you, assertions addressed through substantive procedure, balance sheet, ERCV, profit and loss account, OCACC, and notes is ORCVC. Right, notes is ORCVC. Okay, right. Now I am talking about the chapter of the items of the financial statement. Items of financial statement have been divided under the balance sheet items and the profit and loss account items. Right, what are the balance sheet items that they talk about? Share capital. Right, share capital. Then the other equity. Other equity can also be called as the reserves and surplus. Then the other item of financial statement they talk about is the borrowings. Then after borrowing, they talk about the tangible fixed assets and the intangible fixed assets. Are you with me? 
right tangible fixed assets and then they talk about the intangible fixed assets then they talk about the cash and cash equivalence right cash and cash equivalence then after that over there you have the inventories right the inventories of the company after the inventories you have the trade receivable what is trade receivable debtor right trade receivable then one more type of receivable is loans and advances and the other current assets right loans and advances and also what is combined with it is the other current assets trade receivable loans and advances other current asset is two heading but trade payable and other current liabilities is one heading put together right trade payable and the other current liabilities and then one more last heading over there put together is the provisions and the contingent liabilities right the provisions and the contingent liabilities okay so how many items of the balance sheet have i listed here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 
share capital right then now coming to like just giving an outline first of the chapter what is the second item over there reserves and surplus now reserves and surplus first what they discuss some theory what theory they are discussing over here what is the meaning of a reserve what is the meaning of a provision what is the difference between a reserve and a provision what is the distinguish between revenue reserve and capital reserve so what did i tell you some items before that item there could be some theory then after that you have the audit procedures which are there assertion wise you have the audit procedures which are given assertion you understand assertion ercv oca cc that one and then you have the schedule 3 disclosure so now what has happened for reserves this is the theory then you have the audit procedures to check the existence for addition utilization so very small procedure and then you have the schedule three disclosures right one of the exam they asked a question for each component is reserves and surplus what are the schedule three disclosures required to be given right so that's the schedule three disclosures for reserves and surplus right then coming to borrowing borrowing no theory directly coming to the assertions the audit procedures talking about the existence of borrowing then talking about the completeness of the borrowing and then the valuation so again over here there is no rights and obligation that we see and then again the schedule three disclosures right then the schedule 3 disclosure this is the borrowing now look at the schedule 3 disclosures oh my god and are they asking questions yeah yeah right they do ask questions regarding the schedule 3 disclosure now coming to fixed assets what are the two types of fixed assets tangible fixed assets and the intangible fixed assets so first again theory what is the theory over here capital expenditure and revenue expenditure then talking about the tangible fixed assets how to check the existence how to check the completeness in completeness you have point for checking the addition to fixed asset and how to check the deletion to fixed asset so existence then look over here existence then after that the completeness then after completeness you have the valuation and after valuation you have the rights and obligation that means for tangible fixed assets ercv each of the each of the assertion we have the audit procedures over there and then constant we have the schedule 3 disclosures for the tangible fixed assets then coming to the intangible fixed assets in that again theory what is the definition of an intangible asset right then what are the examples of intangible asset what is an internally generated goodwill whether it can be recognized as an asset no cannot be recognized as an asset internally generated goodwill then again the audit procedures and then after the audit procedures you have the schedule 3 disclosures of the intangible fixed assets are you getting that then on similar lines you have the inventory the trade receivable payable all the items which i have mentioned over here right did you get some understanding right now what we'll do we'll also see what is happening in the question bank I know because that is the what you say. Now see some Schedule Three disclosures which are recently added over there is regarding details of Benami property. Yesterday where did we study Benami property? Caro clause one five, right? Clause one five. Whether any proceed clause. Hmm. Point number four, no. Point number five. That's what I'm saying. Point four is revaluation. Okay. Point five is regarding the. benami property whether any proceedings have been initiated or pending the last one over there right so benami property you know why i taught you faro first and then we come to items of financial statement because you see oh all what auditor has to report in caro has now been added in schedule 3 disclosure so what auditor has to do from schedule 3 disclosure control c and in caro report control v you understand no okay why all this has come in caro why it has come because why it has been added in schedule 3 disclosure because all of it is the reporting requirement under caro so benami property struck off company means the right you know companies which don't have any existence like winding up type then ratios to be disclosed then also crypto
Okay, right. So then why these questions are coming over here, as I said, because of they were there in the old syllabus, but they are still asking those questions over there. So refund of general insurance premium, receipt of insurance claim, receipt of capital subsidy, then sale proceeds of scrap material, right? Then also profit on sale, profit or loss arising on sale of plots by real estate dealer. You know, so real estate dealer, he's selling the plot. So how the income is to be recognized on the same. Then coming to purchases. Purchases, analytical procedure, question asked two times. Right? Then after that, the assertions. Then understanding the hiring, appraisal, and retirement process. So that is what the employee benefit expenses. So they are asking the theory, and they are asking the Schedule 3 disclosures for the employee benefit expenses. Then the depreciation, amortization, Schedule 3 disclosures of depreciation amortization attributes while verifying the other expenses rent expenses power and fuel expenses then now so so many income i showed you other refund of general insurance premium paid receipt of insurance claim did you see these income items and a receipt of capital subsidy and also all similarly in the expense what are the items we have right expense like advertisement expense foreign travel expenses of the company payment of taxes right then also schedule 3 disclosures of the other expenses over there then some question regarding the csr and what recent question they asked i also told you is regarding the benami property right the schedule 3 disclosures for the benami property right so anyways have we seen the location on google we know what is the road which we need to navigate through. Everybody, did you get an understanding? Okay, right. So we need to check for the balance sheet items and we need to check for the profit and loss account items, right? Later on, I can you know, share with you this. Just give this to you. But this is where I have prepared a list wherein you know okay, for which balance sheet item, what are the assertions. So for balance share capital, we only check existence, completeness, valuation. There, there is no rights and obligation. And what are the retail questions over there? premium discounts sweat equity shares and the reduction of capital then for reserves and surplus we only have the point regarding the existence schedule 3 disclosure is always there that is constant right and then what are the questions over there provision and reserve then borrowings we check for existence completeness valuation and then there is just the schedule 3 disclosures and no extra question over there are you getting then for tangible intangible fixed assets and on similar lines we also have the questions regarding the income statement caption right so that is why the chapter looks so big and so huge why because we don't know only what all is there in the chapter so now at least do you know 17 items of the financial statement each item which you pick up what are you going to study for that item theory the assertion wise audit procedure and the schedule 3 disclosures clear to everyone right let's begin with the first balance sheet item over there which is regarding the share capital right let's begin with the first item so some of the students in the recordings if they would have lost my voice during that yes you, i just discussed what was happening in the question bank and then now we come to the discussion of the chapter right that is the balance sheet items over there what is the first balance sheet item share capital and again you know like as old syllabus no what was happening in the old syllabus it was only how will you vouch oblique verify the following building it was never given assertion wise now what has happened in the new syllabus it is given assertion wise okay how will you check the valuation how will you check the existence so you know in the question bank can they add you know is there a possibility of many new questions coming from this particular chapter Right, so much of the chapter is yet to be asked in the exam. So I think at least na la next 10 years, they have enough questions to be asked. And uh, so many of questions from this chapter which are yet to be asked in the exams. Getting everyone? Okay. Right, so now coming to share capital. How do you check the existence? You check it from the previous year audited financial statements. And uh, you compare it with the previous year. How to check the completeness? Check whether there is no change. And for that, you can take the representation from the management. And then you want to check the valuation of the share capital. The amount at which the share capital has been recorded. So again, you need to check whether there has been any change in the paid up capital the limits of the authorized capital have they been increased from where can i check authorized capital moa and then obviously for all these types of share capital changes what is required is the resolutions right so you need to verify the relevant resolutions then also you need to check for any fresh issue that is any new shares issue during the year you need to check the compliance with the provisions of the companies act and then what are the other points no shares have been issued at a discount
discount. Why? Because any shares issued at a discounted price shall be null and void, except for shares which are issued to the creditors or so under a statutory resolution plan or so. But generally, any shares issued by the company at a discounted price shall be null and void, right? You cannot issue a shares at discount apart from the sweat equity shares, okay? Right, then shares issued for consideration other than cash. Then check compliance with SEBI regulations and guideline. Also the copies of the forms filed with the MCA and increase in share capital. Company has given the fee to the MCA, right? So these are the audit procedures for checking the valuation of the share capital. Right, then after the valuation, now we have some nitty gritties over there. What are the nitty gritties? Shares issued at a premium, right? So can a company issue shares at a premium? Face value, 10 rupees, issued at 100 rupees. So 90 rupees is the premium. Is this premium, is it shown under equity or is it shown under other equity? Other equity, it comes under the reserves and surplus. And what is the application of the securities premium account? Right, one, it can be used for the issue of the bonus shares or it can be used for writing of the preliminary expenses of the company or it can be used for writing of the commission or the expense on the commission expense or the discount allowed on any issue of shares or debentures of the company right what are we this is a pure accounting question in a by mistake it came in audit paper but actually it's a by mistake no it comes in audit paper but it has nothing to do with audit as such it's a pure accounting question. What are the application of the securities premium account? One, for the issue of the bonus shares. Then after that, what does it say? The writing of the preliminary expenses, writing of the commission discount or the expense on the issue of any shares or debentures of the company. Then for providing for the premium payable on the redemption of any redeemable preference shares or debentures of the company. And also for buyback, that is purchase of its own security. Application of the security premium account. Are you getting ATF question from this chapter? The application of the securities premium account. Okay. Right. Then after that, the verification. As an auditor, you need to check whether securities premium amount has been shown separately and also it has been applied for the purposes which is allowed as per law. Okay. Then shares issued at a discount. What does it say? Any shares issued by a company at a discounted price shall be void. But only which are the shares which are allowed? It says a company shall not issue shares at a discount except in case of the sweat equity shares and also apart from sweat equity shares now what is also now allowed the shares issued at a discount to its creditors when its debt is converted into the share as per the SRP or the DRS what is SRP statutory resolution plan or the debt restructuring scheme Right, statutory resolution plan or the debt restructuring scheme in accordance with the guidelines, directions, regulations specified under the RBI Act. Right, so first rule, what does it say? Apart from sweat equity shares, you cannot issue any shares at a discount. Then what does it say? Any shares issued at a discounted price shall be void. However, discounted shares can be issued to the creditors as per the statutory resolution plan or the debt restructuring scheme in accordance with the guidelines, directions of the RBI. And what if any company contravenes? If it still issues the shares at a discount, it says it will have to punishable with a fine, which may extend to the amount equal to the amount raised through the issue of shares at a discount or 5 lakh whichever is less and the company will have to refund the amount along with interest at the rate of 12% per annum. Right, so what does it say? What is the fine for the company? The amount which has been raised, right? The um, equal to the amount which has been raised at a discount or 5 lakh, whichever is less. And what does it say? The company will have to refund the amount for the shares issued at a discount along with interest at the rate of 12% per annum. Okay, now understand and notice one thing over here. What I read right now for over here, what we saw right now over here, this is the legal provision. This is the company law provision regarding the shares issued at a discount. Now, in the exam, if they ask me what are the provisions under Companies Act for shares issued at a discount, I write down this. And if they ask me as an auditor, what are the audit procedure you will perform for shares issued at a discount? Now, immediately you have to wear the green color sunglasses. When I wear green color sunglasses, how the entire world will look to me? green in color. When I wear green color sunglasses, obviously entire world will now look to me green in color. Green means now I have to write it as an audit procedure. The auditor needs to check. The auditor shall verify. 
you understand so when they ask me legal provision i write down above if they ask me audit procedures for shares issued at a discount i write the auditor needs to check the movement in the share capital and whether there is any issue he should verify that company has not issued any shares by yes at a discount by reading the minutes of the meeting and the shareholders authorizing the issue of share capital and the share price issue price so how do i come to know whether company has issued any shares at a discount by reading the minutes of the meeting then further the auditor shall verify whether the company has issued the shares at a discount to the creditor when debt is converted into shares in pursuance of the srp or the drs is it in accordance with the rbi regulation so as an auditor i am going to check if shares have been issued at a discount to the creditors as per the srp or the drs whether it is in compliance with the rbi regulations are you getting see what is the provision of the companies act say some point a special resolution is to be passed in general meeting for reduction of share capital this is the provision of the company law now how i write it in my answer the auditor shall verify whether a special resolution has been passed in the general meeting for issue of the for reduction of the share capital are you understanding you understand what i say i'm asking you you only don't look aside i'm asking you you understand what i say okay right so that is where we are talking about the legal provision and the audit procedures legal provision you wear need to wear blue color sunglasses and the audit procedures you need to wear the green color sunglasses now how my answer starts the auditor should check the auditor should verify the auditor should examine he should see he should ascertain he should study he should obtain he should inquire because now i am writing down the audit procedures are you understanding that okay right then after that sweat equity shares right so again first you have the legal provision so that is blue color and then audit procedure that means the green color so as an auditor what i need to check whether the issue has been authorized by a special resolution when the resolution should specify the detail the number of shares current market price consideration and the directors to whom the shares have been issued at a discounted price the sweat equity shares then what does it say sweat equity shares in case of a listed company is it as per the sefi regulation right then if or in case of a listed company whether sweat equity shares are issued as per the sefi regulation and if it is not listed whether it is in accordance with the rules with the rules as may be prescribed then what does it say now just because the shares are issued at a discount or that is sweat equity shares is there any special privilege to the shareholders no they say they are pari passu with the other equity shareholders right they are pari passu an auditor needs to verify whether fresh issue of shares was a right or a preferential issue and accordingly check the compliance with the provisions of the companies act 2013 right so that's the audit of the sweat equity shares what are the requirement special resolution then the resolution shall specify the details of the sweat equity issue then after that right what does it say if it's listed then sebi regulation non listed then the guidelines have been followed pari passu with the other equity shareholders and complied with the provisions of the companies act okay next one what is next one reduction of share capital what are the provisions for reduction of share capital what is the requirement for reduction of share capital you know company law yes yes what is required for reduction of share capital special resolution in the general meeting and also the tribunal of the tribunal order is required for the reduction of the share capital the tribunal may also order the company to use the words and reduced after its name you also need to check the articles of association and the memorandum that whether the authorized share capital has been reduced because there is a reduction of the share capital right now reduction so you are doing an internal reconstruction over there so you need to check the accounting entries which have been passed and also the revaluation of the assets right so accounting entries and also the revaluation of the assets you also need to study the register of members for the reduction of the share capital right so at least this first part of our discussion which is regarding share capital requires you to have a lot of accounting knowledge over there right it requires all your accounts knowledge and based on that you write down the audit procedures right based on that you write down the audit procedures and then we come to the schedule 3 disclosures of the share capital everybody with me
right now coming to schedule 3 disclosure what does it say for each class what are the different classes equity share capital preference share capital for each share capital what you have to give authorized issued subscribe fully paid up subscribe but not fully paid par value of the share balance at the beginning of the year end of the period rights preferences restrictions attached to the distribution of the share share in respect of each class then any shareholder holding more than 5% right of the shares again you have to specify it separately right then shares which are issued under the options or contract and again for immediately 5 years what details are required to be given shares have been issued without payment being received in cash any bonus shares and any buyback of shares these details are to be given for last 5 years then you know for last 5 years if anything has happened in the last 5 year then any terms of any convertible security calls unpaid forfeited share then also the share holding of the promoters is required to be given right then today did i discuss with you i discussed only i want to ask do you remember 143 3 J in the J I discussed the E in the E I discussed the E one E two E three. What was E one? No funds have been. Yeah, company given to intermediary with intermediary giving to ultimate beneficiary. No funds have been advanced. Company is giving to intermediary and what was one two uh, E two? No funds have been received from the funding party. And so intermediary giving to company that is funding party giving to the company. Now this auditor needs to report. Auditor says how I come to know? Don't worry, they've added it in the Schedule Three disclosures. What they've added in the Schedule Three disclosures? Fund advanced or loaned or invested in the intermediary. Then has received any fund from any funding party. Right, so all under that E one. You remember E one? I did no fund have been advanced, no funds have been received. So one forty three three J in the J the E one, and then you also have the E two. And same thing. So because auditors say, how do I check? Schedule three disclosures are there. Don't worry. But obviously we need to check whether Schedule three disclosures have been properly given. Are you understanding that? Company giving to intermediary and funding party giving it to the company, right? So E one and the E two, right? So yes, we've completed one item out of the seventeen. So sixteen more to go. You know, you can keep yourself motivated that way. Are you understanding, right? So at least you know now. Okay, what are the items? And obviously, this is a very simple item over there, right? Now coming to the meaning of the provision, right? So what is the meaning of the provision that we have? Let me see if I can just uh, quickly find a question. I'm not sure where I had seen that question. Ha! Huh? See over here. Which of the following condition is not required to be met for recognizing a provision? MCQ, where a possible obligation that arises from a past event and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events, not wholly within the control of entity. I know when an entity has a present obligation as a result of past event, a reliable estimate can be made to the amount of the of the amount of obligation, and it is probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation. So present obligation, then a reliable estimate, and it is probable that an outflow of resources will be required to settle the obligation. Where this is given, this is given in the definition of the provision. Right here, what we are seeing is it is given in the definition of the provision. So obviously, when it's a present obligation, if it's a possible obligation, which is as a result of a occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain event, not wholly within the control of the entity, this is the definition of a contingent liability. So which of the following condition is not requ required to be met for recognizing a provision? Condition number one. Right. So that's the A point over there. Are you getting how the MCQs are also coming in the exam, right? How the questions are being drafted over there? Okay, which? Okay, the, for this we need to read the case study. Only they can say which of the following assertion. Okay, right. So, anyways, right now let's come to the meaning of the provision. So, what is a provision? It says a revenue, any amount which has been charged against revenue, one for renewal or diminution in the value of the asset, or for a known liability or a claim which is disputed. So, you've kept aside money for the. 
depletion of the value of the asset or there is a known liability or a claim which is disputed and what is the provision it says it is an amount appropriated out of the profit right it is an amount which is appropriated out of the profit and then what are the audit procedures existence how do you check the oh, existence opening balance you check it from the previous year audited financial statements then you need to check the addition deletion during the year you know addition to the reserves or the utilization of the reserves during the year so trace the movement to the surplus deficit as, uh, deficit as per the pnl then also check the statement in the changes in the equity then obviously who can recommend the dividend board of directors who will declare the dividend shareholders right so dividend has been recommended by the board and has been declared by the shareholders then proposed dividend do you need to pass an accounting entry proposed dividend do you need to pass an accounting entry no only to be disclosed in the notes to account right so again you need to check should not recognize dividend as a liability it should only be disclosed in the notes and again you need to check the shares which have been issued at a premium so securities premium because that also comes under the reserves and surplus that also comes under the reserves and surplus okay and then you have the presentation disclosure what are the different classification of other equity what are the types of other equity right what are the types of reserves of the company capital reserve capital redemption reserve securities premium debenture redemption reserve revaluation reserve share option outstanding other balances then surplus yes and also addition deletions in any of the above right so these are the varieties of the reserves and surplus what is the variety capital reserve capital redemption reserve securities premium debenture redemption reserve then what does it say for each of the item for each of the classification like say reserves and surplus is one item then uh, sorry capital reserve is one item capital redemption reserve is another item securities premium is another item you understand what i say for each of the classification for each of the component of reserves and surplus what break up you have to give balance at the beginning of the year any change due to change in the accounting policy total profit for the year dividend transfer to retained earning any other change and balance at the end of the reporting period so opening balance add less and closing has this been asked as a question in your exams already asked as a question in your exam right so what are the reserves and surplus this is the variety for each reserve and surplus what break up you have to give this is the break up you have to give you understand the difference in the two question first question is what what are the classification of other equity and then for each component of other equity what what you break up have you need to give of the same right so each component of the other equity are you getting that balance at the beginning of the year change due to change in accounting policy profit dividend earning and also any other changes and the balance at the end of the period so simple opening balance add less and the closing okay right now coming to the third item of the financial statement over there which is the borrowing now for borrowing what we have to discuss existence completeness valuation and then obviously come the schedule 3 disclosures right then obviously comes the schedule 3 disclosures everybody with me yes anybody having any apprehensions anybody who is lost anybody who is still in the chapter of bank audit or not there in the class right we don't we, we are going at it in a particular speed because we have to maintain the speed okay right but obviously speed cannot be at the cost of compromising on the quality or you getting some hold up at least of what we are discussing you understand the point over here okay right so now coming to the next item over there which is the borrowings and borrowings what we have to check the existence of the borrowing then we have to check the completeness of the borrowings then we have to check the valuation and then goes without saying that we have to check the schedule 3 disclosure so schedule 3 disclosure to separate only right now how to check the existence of the borrowing borrowing means what company balance sheet you are seeing that they are saying we've taken a loan from the bank of 5000 crore right what could be the types of borrowing that they are saying one they could have taken a loan or they could have taken a finance lease or there could be debentures issued by the company because that is also a type of borrowing only right so now for that how do i come to know the existence how do i come to know the existence i can check the 
very good i can check the loan agreement in case if it's a loan if it is a lease i can check the lease agreement if it is a debt then i can check the debenture trust deed i can check the debenture trust deed are you understanding then if it's a loan how i can check the existence i can obtain the confirmation from the bank financial institution i can also check the minutes of the meeting right i can also inspect the minutes of the meeting are you understanding the points over there right so loan agreement lease agreement trust deed then what do we say bank confirmation and the board minutes and any retirement of debt and written representations right so what are the next two points we have over there the retirement of the debt retirement means what the loan has been totally repaid during the year or the debentures have been redeemed during the year and so that need not be shown now in your liability and again you need to take the written representations from the management right so that is for the existence now what your mind needs to develop as i discuss these 11 items of the balance sheet you know and then we come to profit and loss six items your mind has to develop a thought process ke ah existence how to check so like we said existence whether really have they taken a loan check the agreement loan agreement lease agreement trust deed so likewise you know you because not necessary that you can remember all of this but if you understand you can write the correct point on your own also you understand what i say over here right so as we proceed further now you know those two were thoda little different only that uh, what do you say the share capital and the reserves and surplus now comes the real you know the content of the chapter over here wherein now we are talking about existence how you check the existence by checking the loan agreement lease agreement the trust deed confirmation and the minutes of the meeting any retirement of the debt and also the written representation okay now keep one more point in your mind whenever i have to check completeness means i want to check all whenever i want to check all that means i when first ask the management to give me the schedule and what do you mean by schedule opening balance add less and the closing right opening balance add less and the closing whenever i want to check the completeness so what does it say obtain a schedule of the borrowing right schedule of the borrowing means what the balance which was there outstanding at the beginning of the year then the ending balances then also you can inspect through the minutes of the meeting contracts confirmation any subsequent cash disbursement and then also check the closing balances right so very important for the completeness is what you need to check for the obtain a schedule what is schedule opening add less and the closing right opening add less and the closing then you also need to check for subsequent transaction after the end of the reporting period why after the end of the reporting period so to check whether there are unrecorded liabilities at the year end and transactions are recorded in the correct period that is fresh loan taken near the balance sheet date that is company took a loan on 31st march but they didn't show it as a liability on 31st of march it was unrecorded and when it was shown as a liability on 2nd april right so what does the second point over there okay don't only check opening add less closing also check the loans which have been taken just after the end of the year because you know 31st march when i will do audit say i start audit from 4th april so i check you know any loans have been taken after the balance sheet date also then you are saying are this is not after balance sheet date you are just recording it after balance sheet date you had actually taken it before the balance sheet date only so show it in your 31st march liability only it should not be an unrecorded liability so what is the important word over there it should not be an unrecorded liability for that you need to check for the subsequent transaction then after that what do they what i want to ensure whether all completeness keep it fixed in your mind what i want to check all so again how to check all again i can ask the bank i ask company how many loans you've taken they say 3 i ask bank how many loans have you given them bank should also say 3 and if bank says five then it is not completeness so again what is one more procedure over here the direct confirmation procedure so for that you follow sa 505 external confirmations direct written response to the auditor from the third party right so direct confirmation procedures right so as certain the confirmation ask for all information send reminder for the non reply and again compare the balance as per the confirmation with the amount which is written in the books of account and any differences you need to ask the reconciliations for the same
right? You need to ask the reconciliation. So if in the exam they ask me regarding completeness of borrowing, I cannot write anything apart from this. And what is this? Right? The scheduled, then the subsequent transactions and the direct confirmation procedures. Are you getting the points over here? Right. Then valuation is, oh my God. But now, just like I told you some thumb rules. What did I tell you? Thumb rule for completeness. What is the thumb rule? Completeness, thumb rule, all. And then after that, you need to obtain a schedule. That means opening balance, ad less and the closing. That's the thumb rule. Completeness means I'm checking for all. But how to check for all? For that, I need to obtain the schedule. Similarly, now I'm telling you a thumb rule for the valuation. Whenever I want to check valuation, most important, I want to check the accounting policy. Accounting policy. That means I want to check the method, how they are accounting for, for the loan. Now, here I'm talking about loan. So, obviously, for the loan, there is going to be the interest on the loan because valuation what do we say along with valuation valuation and allocation right so we also want to check the interest expense one favorite point which comes in valuation is the foreign currency balances restatement at the year end and you know, some foreign currency loans have been taken so whether they have been restated at the year end closing rate you know, so these are constant point for any valuation. What our interest is not a constant point. That is only for borrowing. But like, you know, accounting policy, the method, the foreign currency loan, right? The restatement being done at the year end date. These are the constant points for the valuation because your brain has to understand. Now, what your brain has to understand? Okay, value I have to check. Value means I have to check the amount. Amount is affected by accounting policy. Amount is affected by the closing rate, the closing exchange rate, you know, in case of the foreign currency balances. Are you understanding everyone? Okay, right. So, valuation. What does it say for valuation? Accounting policy. Okay, then after that, the loan agreement. Again, the loan balance and the loan payable, you compare it with the loan agreement, right? Then after that, obviously, important point in valuation is going to be interest and discount and the amortization of the interest. Then the foreign currency loans. Foreign currency loans, restatement of foreign currency balance is outstanding at the end of the year. Are you understanding the point? So now we are talking about valuation. So I'm going to check for the accounting policy. Then I'm also going to check for the interest calculations and the amortization of the interest. Then also I need to check for the foreign currency loans, the restatement at the year end rate, closing exchange rate. Right. Then also, what does it say? You need to check the loan agreement. Okay. Now, obviously, uh, yesterday we had also discussed clause 9C of CARO. What was 9C? What was 9? Then what was 9C? 9 was repayment. What was 9C? Whether? No, no. That was 3. 9C. Whether term loans, have they been? Uh, that was four. But the term loans, have they been applied for the purpose for which they have been obtained? So you tell the bank that I want a loan for purchase of plant and machinery and you did a renovation of your office building. Not good. So you're in the valuation also what we are going to check, whether there has been any misutilization of the loans, whether there have been any misutilization of the loans. Right, then also the security offered against the loan. Right, so what does it say? Loan and the debt agreement. Right, then due dates. Then the covenant. What are covenants? Some condition. You want to change the battery? Change it. Right, so restrictive covenant. What do you mean by covenant? Any conditions attached with the given of the loan. That you know the bank says you have to maintain your current ratio at 2 is to 1. 
for the entire duration when we have given you the loan, you have to maintain your de current ratio at 2 is to 1. That is, if your current assets, if they are 20 crore, your current liability should not be more than 10 crore. Right? So whether these restrictive covenants of the bank, have they been complied? Then the terms in the loan agreement, then also security, whether there has been any fall in the value of security. Today, did we see it in bank audit? Accounts where there is an erosion in the value of security, more than 90 per 50 percent erosion or so. But that is from the context of bank. Now, for the company also, whatever security they've offered, is there any fall in the value of the security? Then they also talk about any higher purchase agreement, you know, because that's also a type of finance only. So that's also a type of the borrowing. Then also the borrowings from related party. Then any bills which have been discounted or bills negotiated. Then also whether the loan borrowed is within the limit then also has not complied with the provisions of the Companies Act, then also whether the loan has been utilized for the purpose, that amount is not used against the interest of the company, and also the company has accepted any deposits, whether directives issued by RBI are complied. Yesterday we studied under Clause 5, deposits from public. Right, so oh my God, like your valuation is crazy. You know, they've given a huge list of points under the valuation of the borrowings. Are you getting that? Right. So one set of point is regarding the existence of borrowing. How to check the existence of the borrowing? Right. Existence of the borrowing. You check for the agreement, the confirmation minutes, retirement and the written representation. Then you need to check for the procedures for the completeness of the borrowing and then also looking into the valuation of the borrowings. Right. What are they again checking in the valuation? The agreement, the higher purchase agreement, the terms in the loan agreement, loan and debt agreement, loan agreement. Right. So again, checking a lot of the agreement over there and now coming to the Schedule 3 disclosures. What are the Schedule 3 disclosures? First for the long term borrowing and then you have the short term borrowing, right? So long term borrowings have to be classified as bonds and debentures, then term loans from banks and from the other parties, then deferred payment liabilities, right? Like your deferred tax liabilities, right? Then the deposits, loans and advances from related parties, long term maturities of the finance lease obligation and the other loans and advances, right? Have you studied this in accounts, schedule three disclosures for each and every item of the financial statement, but you never learnt it over there. Now for audit paper, you need to learn it. And okay, what are the Schedule 3 disclosures for the borrowing? What is the classification of the long-term borrowing? Then each borrowing is to be classified as secured or unsecured. Then whether loans have been guaranteed by directors or others. Then also the bonds and debentures. Then also particulars of redeemed bonds and debentures. Terms of repayment of term loan. Period and amount of continuing default. So this is again good for me for reporting under Clause 9A of CARO. What is Clause 9A? Right, whether the company has defaulted in the repayment of dues to banks, financial institutions or any lender. So is company required to give that detail as per Schedule 3? Yes. So as an auditor, I again copy paste from year to 9A of CARO, whether there has been any default. So this is for the long term borrowing. Then again, now we have the disclosures for the short term borrowing. What does it say? Loans repayable on demand, loans and advances from related party deposits and the other loans and advances. Could it be a retail question in your exam? Yes. Right, the classification of the long term borrowings or the classification of the short term borrowings, right? And then again classified as secured, unsecured, guaranteed, period and amount of default. And again, current maturities of long term borrowing will come under the short term borrowing, you know, current maturities of the long term debt. So whatever loan is to be repaid, say I've taken a 10 year loan, but next one year, whatever amount I have to repay of the loan, that will come in my current maturities. Right, that will come in the current maturities. Okay. Right. Then now again this one. You know, in case if the company has taken any borrowing from bank financial institution, whether the quarterly returns and statements are they in agreement with the books of account? So this is again as per clause two B of CARO. You know, two B working capital in excess of five crore on the security of current assets are the quarterly return statements are they in agreement with the books of account whether the company has been declared to be a willful defaulter that comes under 9b of car right then quarterly return statements are they in agreement with the books of account 2b of car right then after that willful defaulter then the register of the charges utilization of borrowed funds and the share premium again over here what does it say no funds have been advanced no funds have been received 
है ना वॉट वी स्टडीज इन शेयर कैपिटल ऑल्सो ओवर यूर नो फंड एडवांस नो फंड रिसीव राइट सो दैट कम्प्लीट द नेक्स्ट आइटम ऑफ द फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट ओवर देयर विच इज रिगार्डिंग द बोरोइंग राइट सो वॉट आइटम्स हैव वी स्टडीज सो फार share capital reserves and surplus and the borrowing now coming to the next one over there which is the tangible fixed assets and the intangible fixed assets are you all with me right so now we talk about the audit procedures to check the active tangible fixed assets and then also the intangible fixed assets now for each one of them what do we need to check for is all the four assertions what is all the four assertion the existence then the completeness right then the valuation and then obviously you also have the rights and obligation right and you also have the rights and obligation same thing for the intangible also existence completeness valuation and also the rights and obligation are you understanding that right so now tangible fixed assets and then you also have the intangible fixed assets okay like generally tell me ke like legal expenses is it a revenue expenditure or is it a capital expenditure legal expenditure generally is it a, like if i pay fee to the lawyer is it a legal expense or is it a, is it a, a capital expense or is it a revenue expense your confidence is so high in giving the wrong answers that you know i have, have to be more you know concerned while drafting Yes. What did I say? Okay, legal expenses. Is it generally a revenue expense or a capital expense? It is a revenue expense, na. Like I am coming to that. I asked you generally. Generally, that's what my question. Okay, generally, wages paid to the labor is it generally a legal or a capital expense or a revenue expense? It is a revenue expense. Are you understanding? Generally, these expenses are revenue in nature, but in certain circumstances, they qualify as a capital expense. Like what stamp duty or for the purchase of a property, I pay some money to a lawyer. Then can it be capitalized? Yes. Interest wages paid for installation of a machinery. Then can it be capitalized? Yes. You understand wages paid for the installation of a machinery can that be capitalized? Yes. So that is one question over there. Okay, certain expenses, revenue expenses, also qualify as capital expenditure. Certain they are actually what is their nature? Revenue, but they qualify as a capital expense. Why do they qualify? Like wages on installation of machinery, legal expenses in purchase of land and building, freight incurred on purchase of assets. Right. So again, this is a retail question asked in your exams. When you come to the question bank, you'll see a big question on this one. Okay, expenses which are actually revenue nature. In some circumstances, they are capitalized. So why they are capitalized? Because they are related to the acquisition of the asset. Do you understand, everyone? Right. So certain expenses essentially they are of the revenue nature, but still they are capitalized. Right. So why they are capitalized? So if you see this um, particular question, you know, expenses which are essentially of a revenue nature sometimes they are capitalized why they are capitalized what are the examples material and wages for construction of a building legal expenses for the purchase of land or building freight for the purchase of plant and machinery repairs which increases the capacity of an asset if it maintains the capacity of the asset then pnl if it increases the capacity of the asset then capitalized then wages paid for installation of the machinery and interest borrowing cost and no, no, if it qualifies then you can also capitalize okay right so that is one theory question over there do you understand the theory question over there okay, certain expenses essentially of a revenue nature but sometimes they could be capitalized do you understand okay right now coming to the question regarding the audit procedures right audit procedures first for the tangible fixed assets in the tangible fixed assets we talk about the existence how do i check the existence of fixed assets tangible fixed asset company says we have 10000 acs we have 20000 share we have so many building so again first i need to check the physical verification policy that whether all fixed assets have been physically verified at least once in every 3 year because caro also says that you know clause 1b of caro then i need to obtain from the management the physical verification report and you know, what who because whose responsibility physical verification 
management so as an auditor i want the physical verification report and i need to check are they serious about the physical verification or are they taking it very casually so evidence regarding the appropriate supervision of those people who are performing the physical verification okay is it like randomly somebody comes and say 10 chair or 20 chair no 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 they have to put a sticker on each of the fixed asset which is physically verified you might have seen you know companies they have the stickers each item is properly tagged you know fixed asset also and inventory also needs to be tagged right so physical verification policy at least once in 2 to 3 year physical verification report and any also the proper supervision are you understanding and in caro also what did we say discrepancies noticed on physical verification have they been properly dealt with in the books of account everybody with me existence of tangible fixed assets how to check physical verification policy physical verification report and also the evidence of the appropriate supervision of those who are doing the physical verification okay now what we will do immediately study the existence of the intangible fixed assets right so now after looking into the existence of the tangible fixed assets let us look into the existence of the intangible fixed asset but before i come to the existence of intangible tell me what is the definition of an intangible asset it is an identifiable non monetary asset again this is a question which comes in the mcq it is an identifiable non monetary asset without physical substance held for number 1 use in the production or supply of goods or services number 2 for rental to others or number 3 it could be used for administrative purposes what is the definition of intangible asset it is an identifiable non monetary asset one well the first part of the definition second part without physical substance and then three uses either held for use in the production or supply of goods or services or it can be used for the rental to others or you could be using it for the administrative purposes okay if infosys says we have a building then how you check existence of building physical verification report if infosys says we have a trademark how do you check the trademark they say we have a trademark we have a patent we have a copyright existence of intangible asset but your inspection how you do what you will do it does not intangible they say we have a what do you say software which we are using for administrative purposes existence of intangible fixed asset how to check in what but that's for rights and obligation na? that is not for the existence See what point you said now. That is rights and obligation, invoices and contract to check whether it is in the name of the entity. But now we are talking about the existence. So how to check? Really, do they have it? Right. You need to check whether it is an active use and whether it is not an active use. Right. So whether that or they say, oh, we have a patent through which we manufacture a car. So then, really, are they using that patent for manufacturing the car? so whether it is an active use and if it is not an active use discard it should be deleted right so active use and not an active use and then again what you need to check if they say we have a software whether the software is an active use and if they say we have designs and drawing you verify the production data to establish the designs and drawings has it been asked as a retail question in the exam yes audit procedures to check the what do you use your question so that's okay that's not very important that can be taken care of after some time why are you telling her about it can she do anything no pay attention look over here right the existence of the intangible fixed asset so active use not an active use then what does it say the existence of the software and the existence of the designs and drawing are you getting the difference in point you get why i'm discussing it together existence of the tangible fixed assets and now i'm talking about the existence of the intangible fixed assets whether it is in active use then if it is not in active use discard then it needs to be discarded then how to check the existence of a software again you need to check whether it is in active use again existence of software you need to check whether it is in the active use and existence of design and drawing for that i need to check the for existence of design and drawings i need to check the 
production data of the company i need to check the production data of the company right so that is how you check the existence of the intangible fixed assets okay now we will come to the completeness of the tangible fixed assets so we will keep on roaming up and down are you understanding now we are talking about the completeness of the tangible fixed asset what did i try to teach you i don't know whether i'm successful so far but what did i say whenever i talk about completeness that means i want to check for all and to check for all i need to obtain the schedule for checking schedule i want the opening balance add less closing and you know, so much of progress is there okay you are able to identify wonderful opening balance where to check from previous year audited financial statements closing balance general ledger closing balance in the general ledger of the current year and then we also need to check the addition additions i need to we have a separate set of point for the additions to ppe and then a separate set of point for the deletions to ppe are these asked as retail question in the exam yes and so in completeness we have addition deletion are they asked as separate question in the exam yes okay right so one what does it say completeness obtain the ppe schedule movement in the ppe schedule what is the movement opening balance addition deletion and the closing balance closing balance i can check it with the books of account opening balance i can check it from the previous year audited financial statements and i also need to check the arithmetical accuracy so now how to check the completeness i need to check the ppe schedule ppe schedule opening add less closing opening i can check it from the previous year audited financial statements closing balance i can check it from the books of account and what i need to check now is the addition and the deletion right addition to the fixed asset how to check can i just get up and buy a laptop for a company or do i is does it first require proper authorization before authorization or after authorization can i just go and buy one laptop over there or do i first need to call for the quotation right you also need to call for the quotation then along with the laptop say if i purchase an antivirus software for it yes does it qualify to be added to the cost of the asset right so you need to check the incidental expenses whether they can be added to the cost of the asset then whether the asset whether it meets the recognition criteria of the inda 16 or the as 10 you know the recognition criteria of the inda 16 or the as 10 you know whether the asset fulfills that criteria then service cost should i add it to the cost of the asset repairs and maintenance of the asset which does not maintain increase the capacity it maintains the capacity should i add it to the cost of the asset no 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 service cost should not be added to the cost of the asset so now i talk about the addition to ppe number 1 ask client give me a list of all the additions you did during the year then what does it say expenditure does it meet the criteria of ppe right then what is the cost what can be added to the cost of an asset the cost incurred to acquire or construct an item then we check whether it meets the criteria as per the as 10 in as 16 then spare parts stand by equipment servicing equipment can be recognized as ppe only when they are held for more than one year then service cost is not recognized as the capital as it is day to day servicing right then also what did i say now company if i purchase a laptop there should be a proper invoice then the installation certificate or if purchase plant and machinery or other similar documentation again the addition should be approved by an authorized personnel and can you just get up and buy a laptop no there is a proper internal process and procedure like inviting competitive quotation floating tender etc that followed prior to finalizing the vendor right for procuring the item of the ppe are you understanding addition to ppe right so now if i just differently want to write down the points over there for the addition to ppe right so if i write it on a separate page are you all with me what points am i now talking about is the additions to the ppe right so one what i need i want a list of all the addition then whether it meets the criteria for the recognition as an asset then i also need to check the compliance as per in as 16 or the as 10 right then also what do we say service cost should not be added to the cost of the asset then any standby or servicing should be added only if it is hold for more than one year 
है ना ओनली वेन इट इज हेल्ड फॉर मोर देन वन ईयर देन आफ्टर दैट वॉट डज इट से देर शुड बी प्रॉपर ऑथराइजेशन फॉर द परचेस ऑफ द एसेट एंड द कंपनी शुड कॉल फॉर द कोटेशन बिफोर परचेस ऑफ द एसेट right so these are the points i need to write in my answer for the additions to ppe hai na additions to ppe now obviously after additions to ppe i am going to discuss with you the additions to intangible asset are you getting now what are the points we are going to see over there the additions to the intangible assets right what are the points for addition to intangible asset again this is the common point common point means the schedule opening balance add less and the closing then arithmetical accuracy then how to check addition actually addition point starts from here how to check for addition you get the listing of the addition then the recognition criteria of intangible asset what is the unique point over here research cost can it be capitalized research expenditure can it be capitalized no research expenditure can never be capitalized it is always required to be charged to the profit and loss account then obviously in case if the company is you know starting the having as having a patent or a trademark then you again when it should be recognized as an asset from the date of commencement of the commercial production so what is a very unique point over there commencement of the commercial production for the date of putting the asset to use and then other points are they same whether additions have been approved by an appropriate personnel and are they calling for quotation tender is yes, before finalizing the vendor right so that point is same authorization and the quotation so is it similar but what is little different for addition to ppe little different is the service cost and the standby right and here for intangible what is little different research cost and the commencement of the commercial production right when you hit them against each other then come out the differences and the similarity right when you hit them when you study them together okay now we'll talk about the deletions right now we talk about the deletions to ppe and the deletions to the intangible assets is everybody understanding what is happening okay which assertion are we talking about completeness in completeness we are discussing all of this okay right so one you need to check okay, why do you want to delete your asset why do you want to sell your asset then again can just anybody get up and sell the asset of the company right so one the reason then one you say no no it has become very old so then obviously the sale has to be approved then can you just get up and sell it to anybody no there has to be a process to be followed again you call for quotation and you try to sell it on two three different portal one portal is giving you 5000 another is giving you 3000 somebody is giving 7000 and then also will there be any gain or loss on say disposal of the asset right the profit or loss on the disposal of the asset right so now let's look into the deletions of the tangible assets again what is the first point you understand the reason and the rationale for deletion right then after that the management approval and the discard note then the process followed for the disposal and then what does what is the code process again competitive quotes and tender and then the profit or loss on the sale of the asset has it been properly recorded in the books of account reason approval process and gain or loss on the disposal for deletions to intangible asset same to same what is same to same reason and the rational then the management approval then the process followed and the profit or loss on the disposal of the intangible asset right so same to same four points for the deletions of the intangible assets also okay right so have we completed with the completeness part over here right have we completed with the completeness part for tangible and intangible asset yes now we'll talk about the valuation uh, now before i show you what is written over there right do you remember valuation what did i tell you valuation accounting policy hai na accounting policy then what did i say the method followed right now you, the, uh, when it was borrowing that time i wrote interest now when i'm writing about tangible fixed assets i will write depreciation when i am talking about the intangible fixed assets then i will talk about the amortization is it obvious is it proper depreciation amortization then obviously valuation i need to check whether there is any 
impairment in the value of the asset right the impairment assessment and also any revaluation of the asset right any revaluation of the asset right so now we talk about the valuation so valuation what does it say depreciation on all the ppe except for the non depreciable asset like the freehold land then the depreciation method does it reflect the future economic benefits as expected to be consumed right? so what method they should use which reflects the pattern of consumption of the asset and then you also need to check for the impairment assessment right so what are the three points you have in the valuation over there depreciation then the method and the is the impairment assessment right also the third point over there is the impairment assessment right so impairment assessment what points do we have for the right the valuation of the intangible assets over there amortization method of amortization so instead of the depreciation now you have the amortization the method then also the impairment assessment and obviously one more point ki impairment assessment which is the accounting standard for that as 28 right as 28 so intangible assets again the completeness how you check opening ad less and the closing valuation how do you check you check for the amortization then the method and again the impairment assessment are you understanding right the impairment assessment right the impairment assessment and obviously one also this point as 28 i can write for tangible fixed assets also you know nothing stops me from writing it over there also right so now we are left with the last assertion for ppe and the last assertion for the intangible assets what is the assertion for ppe now the rights and obligation rights and obligation means whether the asset is in the name of the company now a tangible fixed asset could be a tangible no now what am i talking about right now is the tangible fixed asset it could be a movable property and physical so it has to be no it is tangible no you know in physical verification say how you come to know right through physical verification you come to know existence does the building exist yeah physical verification but now who, by looking at the building do i come to know whose name it is no so for that i have to check rights and obligation very good you did the mistake so that you don't do it again okay right so movable and the immovable oh what i'm saying tangible could be further movable can i pick this up and put it somewhere else yes this building can i pick it up and put it somewhere else no hai na unless they show it in some movie that the entire building also they are transferring from one place to another right anyways right so movable and immovable right so now immovable property how do i check the rights and obligation the title deeds are a clause uh, tell me which clause of caro title deeds of immovable properties are they held in the name of the company one see and the title deeds of immovable properties are they held in the name of the company so can this building be in the name of the company yes but can this furniture be in the name of the company no in this case the invoice can be in the name of the company right the invoice of the furniture can be in the name of the company then can it so happen that against my physical uh, tangible fixed assets company has taken a loan right can it can you take a loan against your asset right so in that case will the asset will be with you no it will be with the bank it will be whatever different types of mode of creation of security so in that case you can obtain the confirmation and again you need to verify the register of the charges okay right so purchase invoices for re it is immovable how you say don't read apply purchase invoices for purchase invoice for movable then conveyance deed and title deed for immovable property confirmation when it has been given as a security to the bank and you can also verify the register of the charges are you getting that rights and obligation of the tangible fixed assets invoices invoices for movable though they have not written this is for our support we are writing it over there right then what does it say conveyance deed title deed for right conveyance deed title deeds are for the immovable properties right for the immovable properties then you can also obtain the 
confirmation and then you also need to check the register of the charges right register of the charges okay all the assets of the company which have been given as a security intangible assets how to check the rights and obligation only one point over there you need to verify the invoice and the contracts right the invoice or the contract right the invoice or the contract so rights and obligation for tangible fixed assets and then rights and obligation for the intangible fixed assets what is the rights and obligation invoices and contract right giving the legal title of the ownership to the entity okay so ercv ercv done right when you prepare something on your own when you study it on your own it's wonderful then you can remember this better if i give you a ready made chart over there nothing you just keep on staring at the ready made chart Right, but when we create it on our own, better understanding. And then also what do we have is the Schedule 3 disclosure. Huh? Now everybody knows the chapter. And now we have the Schedule 3 disclosures for tangible and intangible. What is the breakup of tangible? Land, building, plant and equipment, furniture, fixture, vehicle, office equipment and the others. Then obviously freehold land, leasehold land has to be shown separately. Then what does it say? Gross and net carrying value. So balance at the beginning of the year, end of the period has to be shown separately. Again, life is wonderful. Why? Amount of change due to revaluation. If change is 10% or more in the aggregate of the net carrying value. Right, again clause 1D of CARO which says that if any revaluation has been done, whether revaluation has been done by registered valuer, then amount of change and if the change is 10% or more for each class of PPE. Right, so this corresponds to clause 1D of the CARO. Right, then sums have been written off on reduction of the capital or the revaluation of the asset. And then for each class of PPE, do you understand the difference? Like for reserves and surplus, we had studied breakup of reserves and surplus and for each reserve and surplus, opening, ag less, closing. So like now, what is the classification over here? This is the classification. Now for each item, what breakup is to be given? Like for land, you understand what I say? For each item, what breakup is to be given? Opening balance, addition, acquisition through business combination, disposal, disposal through demerger, other adjustment, borrowing cost capitalized, closing balance of the gross carrying amount for each item of the tangible fixed asset. Then for each PPE, further what you have to give, opening accumulated depreciation, charge for the year, deduction, closing accumulated depreciation. And for each par class of PPE, other accumulated impairment losses, impairment losses, impairment reversals, and the closing accumulated impairment losses. Right, so for one one item, now what you need to give, the following breakup, opening agless and the closing, then the opening agless and the closing of the depreciation and the opening agless and the closing of the impairment losses. Are you understanding that? Right? At least you should have seen it one time, you know, before you go into the exam hall because you never know where MCQ, where what question comes. Okay, right? And then title deeds of immovable property, clause 1C of CARO, control C, control V. And uh, from the schedule 3 disclosure, you copy it to the caro clause 1c whether title deeds of immovable properties are they held in the name of the company whether revaluation has been done by a registered valuer so that is again as per clause 1d right then cwip now cwip what details are to be given again a question asked in your exam then a CWIP, what breakup of aging schedule of CWIP has been given? One, projects which are in progress and projects which are temporarily suspended. That is, you are constructing a building, but all of a sudden work stopped. And one building work is going on. So what aging is to be given? How old they are? Capital, work in progress. What is your question? work in progress capital work in progress okay right so what does it say less than one year one to two year two to three year and more than three year right so less than one year one to two then two to three and three to years that's more than three years that is the aging of the cwip which is required as per schedule three what is the breakup less than one then one two 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 three and more than three years okay right then also what does it say cwip completion schedule okay how much of it is going to be completed in less than one year one two two year two two three year and more than three years and those which have been suspended those details have to be given separately right so amount in cwip for a period of and also which will be completed in how much of the time 
right this is all the schedule 3 disclosures for the tangible fixed assets then we have the disclosures for the intangible what is the classification goodwill brand trademark computer software masterheads publishing title mining rights copyrights recipe license franchises and the others again for each you need to give the beginning and the end right then any reduction or any revaluation then for each ppe what details you have to give one the right for each the opening address and the closing right then after that the details of the amortization and then after that the details of the impairment losses like what we saw for depreciation also and there we had cwip here we have the intangible assets under the development is the aging same what is the aging less than 1 year 1 to 2 year 2 to 3 year and more than 3 year right intangible assets under development okay right so if you look over here it's this one page two page three right four right five then six then after that seven so almost seven pages for one item of the financial statement over there if you study from study material of ICI there to I think it might be some 20 pages over there here the formatting and the presentation is different and uh, there if you see the content it will look more bigger over there right but have we completed one entire two big items of the financial statement over there that is tangible and the intangible yes Is the same disclosure required for every asset? Is the same audit procedure? The way I check invent inventory, the same way can I check fixed assets? I can't, no. We cannot check it in the same way, no. Right? That is why there are different points over there. Okay, right. So that's first regarding the tangible and the intangible fixed assets okay right we have completed with what the tangible and the intangible fixed assets right so now coming to the one more item over there which is regarding the inventories right so now coming to the next item over there which is regarding the inventories right so now for inventories again what are the audit procedures to check the existence of the inventory obviously also to check the completeness of the inventory right so existence then you have the completeness right no, no sorry, yes for inventory you don't have the completeness because when you check the existence itself you check for the completeness so then you have the rights and obligation and also the valuation of the inventory right so obviously if it is not there the question only won't come in exam for valuation of uh, completeness of inventory Right, because uh, that's what the chart I have prepared over here, no? Okay, for which item of the financial statement with assertion you need to check for. So for inventory, you check for the existence, then you check for the valuation, and you check for the rights and obligation. There is no completeness as such over there for inventory. Why no completeness? Because it says when you check the existence, that time only you reconcile with the books of account, and then the book stock with the physical stock, okay? Right, so audit procedures now for checking of the inventory. For inventory, what are the areas? Existence, then after that the rights and obligation and the valuation. And what question came in exam? Valuation for WIP. You know, we saw that question over there. No? Okay, in valuation, that too they only asked a question regarding the valuation of the WIP. Okay, right. So now existence of the inventory. How do I check that really? If I'm doing the audit of Tata Motors and they say we have twenty thousand cars in stock, or if I'm doing the audit of Kalyan Jewelers or GRT Jewelers or so, they say we have two hundred kg of gold in stock, or you know twenty thousand gold uh, ornaments in stock because that's their inventory, right? If I go to, you know, any jeweler, like if I go to Kalyan Jewelers, what is going to be there in their inventory? Gold. All the jewelry items are going to be there. If I do the audit of Tata Motors, what is going to be in their stock? All the cars are going to be there. If I do the audit of Ambuja Cement, all cement, you know, all the cement is going to be there in the stock over there. So as an auditor, how do I check the existence? How to check the existence? Again, Physical verification, right? Again, physical verification of inventory, whose responsibility? It is the responsibility of the management. So who will be doing the counting of inventory? Management. And what auditor is required to do? He has to attend. 
the physical verification count being conducted by the management so what does it say review the entity plan and you say when are you counting your inventory they say 31st march 3 pm so auditor says no problem 31st march 3 pm i will write in my diary that i have to come to your place why i'll write in my diary because i have to attend you count i attend you understand you count the inventory i attend your inventory count which you are doing you say no i have to attend the birthday party i have to attend the program like that now what you want to attend over your the inventory count physical verification of fixed assets do you compulsorily need to attend no that you may attend you may not attend but physical verification of inventory do you need to attend yes we also have an essay for that essay 501 audit evidence specific consideration for selected item first selected item over there is existence and condition of the inventory right so entity plan and you say they say 31st march 3 pm auditor says done i'll come there 31st march 3 pm are you understanding that okay right then after that now when you go to attend who is counting the inventory management you are going to again count it on a sample basis that means you are going to do the test count are you going to count all the 20000 cars of tata motors again no sample basis some 3 400 cars you may count right so now test count and in test count their full focus is on the tagging of the inventory inventory has been properly tagged like nowadays if you go to a shopper stop or a central or any you know any store for that matter even though if they sell a 2 rupee item over there like you know or they sell a 4 rupees or 5 rupee sharpener over there or a ruler you know of 7 8 rupees or they are selling a computer of say 50000 rupees are all items having a barcode over there are all items properly tagged over there so now auditor when you attend the count you have to do the test count you know auditor when you attend the count you have to do the test count and what you are going to do in the test count you are going to observe the employees who are adhering to the plan so you observe the employees who are doing the counting then ensure that all items are properly tag then also check that whether there is appropriate supervision on the count procedures then observe that the proper amounts are shown on the tag then determine that the tag and summary sheets are controlled and reconciled right so whatever how many tags are there and as per the books of account how much inventory is there right reconciliation of the test counts with the tags and the summary sheets then what does it say be very careful there might be some empty boxes empty boxes means what client says auditor don't open in this box there are two bags of cement so say auditor don't open two bags of cement we just packed yesterday now see audit says say auditor says let me open let no say there is inside that two box of two packs of cement and then you see these employees of the company now see if on your head you keep 200 kg of load and you have to travel some, you know walk somewhere and when it's an empty box and you want to you know go from one place to another you can feel the comfort of the person no on somebody's head it is 200 kg on somebody's head there is just a uh, 1 kg or 2 kg load over there so then client said don't open this box there is 200 kg of cement in it auditor said okay and then after some time he saw some person he came very lightly he picked up the box and he started walking away auditor says what does this person need bone vita or what 200 kg box picking up like this and running auditor says please open the box i want to see why it's an empty box right no inventory in that box right so that again ne auditor needs to check for then auditor also needs to check whether any third party stock any damaged or any obsolete stock right any obsolete stock then significant differences between the physical stock and the stock as per the book so that is again your caro discrepancies of 10% or more have they been properly dealt with in the books of account also check all the stock sheets and also perform the cut off testing what is cut off yes accounting period whether the inventory transactions have they been recorded in the correct accounting period so can this be a retail question in your exam yes at least i am waiting to see a retail question on this one right test count can they ask 100% they can ask and now so what you need to ask management plan they say 31st march 3 pm you say i'll be there so you go to attend the count when we attend the count you observe, yes you do the test count and in the test count you do the following right in the test count you do the following you observe whether the employees are following the plan then all the points regarding the tag then empty boxes cut off testing third party stock all stock sheets and also the significant differences what are we talking about is the 
existence of the inventory. So what is point number one? Entity plan, right? Entity plan. Then auditor, what he needs to do? He needs to attend the count, right? Attend the count. When he attends the count, he needs to do the test count, right? He needs to do the test count. Okay, right. Then after that, what does it say? There could be some consigned goods, right? So consigned goods, they are in the ownership of the consignor or consignee. They are in the ownership of the consignor. So you need to check whether there are any consigned goods. Have they been segregated from the other items of the inventory? So consigned goods and you also need to check inventory lying with the third party. Right? The inventory lying with the third party. So what are two special? Yeah, okay, that's okay. That's a term related to consigned goods. So that's understood. Okay, now what are two points over there? Consigned goods and the consigned goods. Should they be included in inventory? They should be excluded. And inventory, can it happen that Tata Motors and their go down? They did not have place to keep 20,000 cars. That is why 15,000 cars they kept in their go down and 5,000 they kept it with a third party. Can it happen? Inventory of the client is lying with the third party. So again, for that, you can obtain the confirmation from the third party. Are you understanding that? You can obtain the confirmation of the inventory which is held by the third party, like transporters, warehouses, warehouses port authorities, etc. Right? So are you understanding what points I'm talking to you about? Entity plan. Then auditor, you go and attend, then you do the test count. Then it could be consigned goods which should be segregated or there could also be inventory lying with the third party. Then I also need to check whether my client is doing the perpetual or the periodic inventory count. Perpetual means continuously they count the inventory. Then I can go and attend the count on any date. But if they are doing periodic entry counting, then I need to go only at the end of the period. So they, every day we count our stock. So then auditor says I can come any day. But if they say we count it on a periodic basis, then you only have to go on that particular date. So perpetual or periodic system. Then after that, you have the analytical procedure. Analytical procedure, you compare with the industry, budgets and the prior year. So this is all SA520. Right? So compute inventory turnover ratio, vertical analysis, compare budgets with the actual. Whenever in life you fall short of a point, you can always write carry out appropriate analytical procedures. Whenever you fall short of a point, but don't always write. You say, ma'am, I never have points. So the only point I have is analytical procedure. Doesn't work that way. But yeah, whenever you fall short of a point, you can always mention about the analytical procedure. So what are the points we studied now? Perpetual and periodic inventory system. Then you also perform the analytical procedures, right? You also perform the analytical procedures. Then you also check for non-financial information like weights and measurement. Like non-financial information like say 2 kg, 3 kg, the volume of the inventory, right? Then the cutoff, uh, measurement. Measurement means like the inventory is oil. So again, I need to check the liters of the oil which they have. Right, then cutoff test. What is cutoff test? Again, whether the transactions have been recorded in the correct accounting period. What is cutoff? I hope everybody knows. Okay, if I am doing audit for 1st April 2025 to 31st March 2026, what should happen? Only 25, 26 transactions should get recorded. 24, 25 transactions should not come. 26, 27 transactions should not come. Only the transactions of the current period should be recorded. Now, generally for this, what testing is done by the auditor as on 31st March? If I want to check whether the cutoff is proper, I check the last five of the current period and I check the first five of the next period. Okay, last five invoices of 31st March should be recorded in the current period. First five invoices of 1st April should be recorded in the next period. Obviously, that ensures that cutoff is proper. Last five should be recorded. Last five is just an example. You want to check 10, you want to check three, that also you can check. But it's very popularly known as last five and first five. How do you check cutoff? By checking the last five and the first five. Last five should be recorded in the current period. First five should be recorded in the next period. So that is how you check the cutoff. That is what they've said. Purcha perform the purchase and sales cutoff test. You know, so last five purchases recorded in the 
last five purchases recorded in the current period. First five purchases of next year recorded in the next period. That means cutoff is proper, right? So you perform the cutoff test. Then also tagged inventory. What is tagged? All inventory where the stickers have been put, right? It should not include perform test for any omitted or invalid transaction. Okay, inventory is there but not recorded in the books of account. Again, check for the inventory listing and obtain a reconciliation. Right, so that's quite a lot of points over there for the existence of the inventory. Right, that's the points for the existence. Then after existence, we have the rights and obligation. Rights and obligation. Okay, if Tata Motors say this is our car, or if Kalyan Jewellers say this is our jewellery, whenever the customer buys it, then the risk and rewards of ownership will be transferred. But till the time, till the time it's our inventory, it is our ownership. So how do you claim ownership? Again, you need to check the purchases. Right, whether they have actually purchased. Like say they could have purchased the jewellery from some wholesaler. Right, so again, you need to check the purchases. Then again, you check the purchase the rights and obligation for the consigned goods. Then what does it say? You can also review the correspondence, the sales and receivable, and the purchase document. So what does what is it that you are checking for? Rights and obligation, purchases, consigned goods, and the purchase document. Right. Then apart from that, how can you check the ownership of the inventory? Is rights and obligation? Does that mean ownership? Rights and obligation, does it mean ownership? Yes. So how I can check the ownership? I can check three agreements. Which three agreement? Collateral agreement, consignment agreement, and the material purchase commitment agreement. Right. So here you have a point of three agreements. Which three agreement? Right. Collateral agreement, consignment agreement, and the material purchase commitment agreement. Okay. Material purchase commitment agreement. Then obviously if I purchase the raw material, the invoice should be in the name of the company like how we said for movable property the invoice should be in the name of company so here what should be in the name of company the invoice should be in the name of the company again you can obtain the confirmation for significant items and inventory lying with third party you can get a declaration from the third party right so what is the next set of points we have over there is regarding the rights and obligations so for that you need to check the recorded purchases then you also need to check for the right the consigned goods right the consigned goods then you also need to check for the purchase documents right then you need to check for three agreements which are the three agreements over there right collateral agreement consignment agreement and the material purchase commitment agreement and then apart from that it says you check the invoices are they in the name of the entity then again you take the confirmations for significant items from whom i take confirmation from the client only and then for inventory lying with the third party i again take the confirmation from the third party right so confirmation from the third party right so that's the rights and obligation of the inventory are you understanding that rights and obligation and what is the last item over there now, our last assertion over there, valuation. Whenever I talk about valuation, first point has to be method, accounting policy. You know, FIFO, weighted average, which method are they using for the valuation of inventory? Is it right? FIFO or weighted average method. Then valuation of raw material, valuation of work in progress, valuation of the finished goods. Right, raw material, again raw material, how I ch can check valuation? By checking the invoice, by checking the purchase. That means by checking the invoice, right? Then again, what to check? All costs that have been included. Okay, carriage, invert, non-refundable duty should be added to the cost of inventory. What is the golden rule for valuation of inventory? Cost or NRV, whichever is lower. Then generally for raw material, we use the standard costing. So again, you need to ask for any reason. You check the invoices and you check the invoices over there, the purchase invoices. And again, valuation for the damage or the obsolete inventories. What does it say? They have to be recognized at the NRV. Right. So what are the four points which you have for the raw material elements of the cost? Then after that, you have the standard cost then you have the point regarding the invoices and then for the obsolete inventory we have the nrv right so could it be a retail question in your exam yeah they've asked work in progress so why not raw material now 
so elements of cost then standard cost then whether the invoices and then you also check obsolete items have they been shown at the nrv right then work in progress very important for work in progress first thing is the stage of production right the percentage completion ke 30% complete hai na you study na opening wip closing wip 30% 70% right so what does it say the stages of production right these stages of the production based on that what are the elements of cost and if overheads are included the basis on which they are apportioned and material cost excludes any abnormal wastage factor right so for work in progress what are the point stages then again the elements and it excludes any abnormal wastage factors right it excludes any abnormal wastage factors and then what is the third one over there the finished goods and the goods held for resale so again for that what costs are included then inventories are valued at nrv if they are getting a value lower than the cost you know cost or nrv whichever is lower now see if the finished good Yes, there is a point over here. Finished goods. What does it say? Cost or NRV, whichever is lower. Say cost is hundred, NRV is ten rupees. At what price it should be recorded? Ten rupees. Say on this particular finished goods is now having an NRV of ten. Say this is finished goods, but some of them are still work in progress. Like say they are seventy percent complete. Even that should be reduced to NRV. even should that be reduced to nrv because whenever that will become finished goods it will come to 10 rupees only so that what does it say also verify if any of the relevant semi or the partly processed inventories and raw materials have also been written down because my finished goods is having a very low nrv so if i have any such raw material or work in progress even that snoop needs to be written down you understand the point over here right even that needs to be written down okay then what does it say again obsolete slow moving damaged inventory again have to be recorded at the realizable value and you again take check for the inventory ha right so what is the point over there for finished goods costs then again valued at cost or nrv whichever is lower then you also need to check for the obsolete inventory and you also need to check for the aging of the inventory right what are we talking about the valuation so valuation one valuation method then valuation of three over there what are the three raw material work in progress and the finished goods and then you compare recorded cost with replacement cost why recorded cost with replacement cost because that is cost or nrv whichever is lower then you can always perform the analytical procedures overhead allocation and whether they are following the principle of cost or nrv whichever is lower right and then you have the schedule 3 disclosures thankfully it is a very small one what are the schedule 3 disclosures over there mode of valuation and then inventory has been classified as raw material work in progress fg stock in trade stores and spares loose tools others and goods in transit have been disclosed separately right goods in transit have been disclosed separately okay right so what items could we manage to see so far share capital reserve borrowing then the tangible fixed assets intangible fixed assets and the inventory right so quite a lot and we've already had an initial discussion of the chapter right so let's take a break and then after that we shall continue okay